Hey everyone, in today's video I'd like to talk a bit about the process of conducting an intake interview. And specifically I'm aiming this at beginners, uh, folks who are just getting into the process of getting started with therapy of some kind. There are many, many different contexts in which somebody would be doing an intake. Everything from forensic evaluations to psychiatric evaluations, getting started with routine outpatient therapy, meeting someone for the first time in an emergency department, school psychology assessments, neuropsychological assessments, right? There are, are many different types of first encounters with a client. And so there are going to be just as many different types of goals and frameworks that a clinician might use. But I'm specifically thinking for beginners and I'm thinking about folks who are starting a routine outpatient, say once a week or once every other week, sort of therapy or counseling relationship. What are the sort of things that we need to be focusing on? What do I do, right? I get that question a lot from students. What do I do to get started? So I have two major themes that I'd like you to be thinking about that should help address that question. The first is that you are working on building rapport, and the second is that you are working on collecting data. Basically, everything that goes into that first session and any efforts that lead up to it are trying to work toward one of those two things, connecting with the client and learning about them. So let's go through it in a little bit more detail. One of the things I'll recommend for building rapport is that you ask open-ended questions. Again, you're trying to get to know them, and one of the best ways to allow the client or patient to show you who they are is to give really open prompts that give them a lot of freedom in terms of how they'll answer the question and then how the conversation will move forward from there. An easy way to know that you're asking an open-ended question is that it starts with what or how. Or at the very least, you're asking a question that isn't limited to some sort of multiple choice bracketed answer, right? Um, you don't want to be asking questions that boil down to a yes or a no. You don't want to be asking questions that are primarily, you know, the client tells you one of a, a few set of options. Open-ended prompts are the sort that get the client talking about qualitative factors about themselves. They are the sorts of discussion tools that get the person opening up, giving more detail, elaborating, and really allowing you to see inside their life. And that's really important because it helps build a connection between the two of you. Open-ended questions also help keep the focus on the client, right? Rather than presuming what sort of things you want to know about them and asking pointed, direct, objective questions, um, tie into their subjective experience, right? Try to get to know this person through their own phenomenological experience of being who they are. Okay, so open-ended prompts. Second, I want to really emphasize the use of GU, and this stands for genuineness, empathy, and warmth. These are three of some of the most crucial common factors they're referred to as. Uh, these are characteristics of successful therapy relationships across the board, right? Sort of regardless of what sort of modality or context you might be working in. Pretty much any intake that successfully works toward rapport is going to involve these three things. So by genuineness, I mean, ultimately, you have to be yourself. Certainly, you want to be uh, professional, you want to be kind and caring, and sort of putting on your clinician's thinking hat, right? But you don't want to be so professional that you are no longer human. You don't want to be so uptight about saying everything just perfectly that you lose your actual self in the process, right? So be genuine. Um, Sometimes what that means is that if you have an emotional reaction to something the client says, that it's okay to show some of that, right? Uh, the client might benefit from having a bit of a mirror, like, oh, wow, another person would really find that to be distressing. I can see it on my therapist's face, okay? Uh, being genuine with your emotions, being genuine with your questions and your interest, all of that cumulatively adds up to building a good relationship. Uh, empathy, the E in GU, refers to you trying to see the client's life through their own eyes and through their own history. So a lot of people will use the phrase um, walking a mile in someone else's shoes, and that's part of what empathy is, but more importantly, you actually want to be wild, walking a mile in their shoes, but also in their body, in their mind, and in their history of life experiences. 
all while still hanging on to your own outside perspective, right? But by empathizing, you're working really hard to understand the kind of person they are, see their experiences through their eyes, and non-judgmentally find value in what they are sharing with you. And then, of course, you're communicating it back to them so that they know you understand it. So empathy is crucial, and warmth is crucial, the W in goo. Be nice. <laughs> uh, be relatively agreeable, right? And that doesn't mean that you can't ever challenge your client or ask a clarifying question or, or even outright disagree with them at times, but you don't want this to be confrontational. You don't want it to be an argument. You want to be a warm, approachable, pleasant person to talk to. Um, I think we all have that capability, but sometimes we have to really relax ourselves going into the room to, to turn that on and just always be thinking about, okay, what does the client need from me in this moment? How can I best serve them? And often warmth will come out of that, right? If you can find a way to care about them on a human to human basis, connect to that and through that you can offer them warmth. Okay, so be gooey in your intakes. Uh, and last, in terms of building rapport, I would encourage you to be unassuming. And this has numerous layers to it. One is simply that you're not assuming that you have the answer. So you want to refrain from jumping to advice right away. You want to refrain from being too prescriptive with homework or activities, at least not until you've had a good chance to talk about what the client's goals are and to get to know how the problems they're experiencing fit within the context of their life. Right? You don't want to jump in five minutes into the interview and be telling them, well, we need to fix your sleep hygiene, or we need to be correcting those negative automatic thoughts. Five minutes in, you barely know them. Right? Take some time. Refrain from those assumptions. Another layer of being unassuming is that you're not assuming that you know the person based on visible or obvious identity characteristics. Right? So this is a, a multicultural competence skill. Even if the person sitting across from you looks like you, talks like you, appears to be the same age, likely has some of the same worldviews and beliefs, don't presume that you are a match and that you just know all sorts of things about the existence that they walk through, right? You can make some educated guesses, of course, but you always want to be unassuming. You want to be asking, what was it like growing up? What is your faith? How do you identify with an ethnicity or a culture? What is meaningful to you? Who are you, right? Help me to get to know you. By being unassuming, you'll get a lot more detail from your client and they won't feel judged or they won't feel that you're stereotyping them, right? You're connecting to them on a human to human basis, not walking in with presumptions, right? So that's another level of being unassuming. Lastly, I think it's important that we are unassuming in a sort of humble, uh, the clinician isn't better than the client sort of a way. Don't assume that you've got all of life's answers. Don't assume that you are there to fix their problems per se, uh, but instead assume that both you and the client are equally human, are equally flawed, and are working together to figure things out such that the client can benefit from it. So. That's sort of a culmination of different things, but I'm using the label unassuming to kind of tie it all together. I think those are all really important skills for an intake clinician to be using. Okay, so together, those things and many other skills will help you to build a connection with your client, to build rapport. Next, let's talk a little bit about the other key thing that you're doing, which is getting to know them, right? You are collecting data about your client. One of the first things to consider is that you always want your data to be as reliable and valid as possible. I mentioned this in some of my other videos, and in fact, I've, I've done a video on psychological assessment, which talks a bit about reliability and validity, so I'll include a link to that in the video description. But a quick recap, reliability refers to the data you're collecting being true, accurate, honest, and free of error. Okay. Um, if you imagine that somebody has a true score of, say, 90% on some characteristic, let's say they, they truly are 90% depressed, and your assessment of them leads you to believe that they are 92% depressed. Uh, that 2% difference is what we would call error, and error is the opposite of reliability. Validity, on the other hand, has to do with 
the data you're collecting being useful, meaningful, having clinical utility, right? It, it helps you do the thing that you're supposed to be trying to do. So any collection of data should be an attempt at a strong balance and a co-presence of reliability and validity. And that cuts across everything, right? So interview questions that you're asking them in person, any sorts of forms or screeners that you might have them fill out prior to meeting you, or maybe some sort of assessment form that they fill out after they're done with the first session, any of that, you want the psychometric characteristics to be as strong as possible. How do we do that? Well, in terms of reliability, you wanna make sure that the prompts and items that you're using are crafted carefully, are backed up by psychological research, and appear to have characteristics that yield accurate data. In terms of validity, you wanna make sure that you're choosing items, prompts, and questions that are of value. Now, to some extent, you could argue conversation about anything is of value during the intake because see all these things up here, right? I wanna be building rapport. So even if we're just talking about what the client's favorite movie is, maybe that's okay, right? If we're talking about the client's favorite music, maybe that's okay, right? Sure, I'm not against any of that, but you also have a limited amount of time to work with this person. If you're only gonna be seeing them for say one hour once a week for several weeks and you're attempting to work towards some significant change in their life, talking about music sometimes might be great, but you probably wanna make sure that your items and questions worksheets, whatever, what have you, that it's focused on them, that it's focused on their mental health, and it's focused on their experience. So keep things relevant to their functioning and relevant to the issues that the client believes they want to work on, right? This should be a, a co-created plan. Okay, so that's a quick review on reliability and validity. You want your data to be accurate and useful. Second, okay, what do I assess, right? Or in other words, what do I ask? Whether it's on some sort of form or a packet that they fill out before they get to my office, or literally when they're sitting there in front of me, what should I ask them? I think a great way to sort of keep yourself thinking about useful topic areas and, and to frame it is to think about the biopsychosocial model. Mental health is supposedly a combination of biological, psychological, and sociocultural, historical, political influences, right? So in your connecting to the person, in your learning about them, you're assessing them, try to make sure that you're addressing things from each of those areas. So just to give you a few examples, from the biological realm, you might ask questions like, what's your medical history? Tell me about your health. Um, are you using any substances? Would you describe yourself as dependent on any substances? Do you have a history of abusing any substances? Or maybe even more broad than that, what is substance use like for you and what might you use? Uh, are you prescribed any medication that you're taking regularly? Have there been any major diseases or illnesses in your life that have had a lasting impact? What's the story of your family history of medical health? Right? Do things like, say, cancer run in the family or Alzheimer's, right? So the biological realm of things, what is the genetic predisposition and what is the health of this person? In the psychological realm, obviously, we've got a lot to work with there. Anything from experiences, beliefs, common behaviors, habits, the way that the person interacts with others, um, Lots and lots and lots of things make up the psychological uh, realm of this spectrum. And then on the social end of the spectrum, be thinking macro, right? Be thinking big picture. What is this person's racial, cultural, spiritual, and religious identity? And how does that fit into the community that they live in? Um, how would you describe their socioeconomic status? How would you describe their level of privilege or their level of feeling oppressed by their context? Um, how well are they connected to peers? How well are they connected to social support of various broad kinds? Where do they work? What do they do? What do they like to do for fun? Right? All of this is relevant. So if you are partway through an intake interview and you start to feel like, oh, I'm running out of questions, what do I do? Just kind of say to yourself, biopsychosocial, biopsychosocial. And 
you should be able to come up with something to ask them. Better yet, just follow the client's lead, but be paying attention to those different markers so that you can jot down little things about their family history, their medical health, their beliefs, their common behaviors, etc. And it'll come up organically as you continue to talk through their life. But occasionally you're going to hit a dry spot in the conversation where you don't know what to say next and the client doesn't know what to say next. That's a great time to pause and say, what am I missing? Either out loud and just let them fill in for you or in your head and then kind of go through, okay, which biopsychosocial area have I not addressed quite as much? Okay, so those are some things to ask about. I should probably also mention in any intake, you're probably going to want to ask some crucial safety oriented questions. So things like their suicide history, their suicidal intent, um, severe substance abuse or dependence, uh, history of severe or chronic mental health issues, whether they feel safe at home, whether they have a history of abuse or trauma. And again, a lot of that is sensitive. You may not want those to be the very first things that you ask in the interview. Um, but in any interview across a number of different kinds of contexts, you're going to want to be assessing for safety and stability. So be thinking about that as well. Um, other parts of, of what you fill in will vary from one theoretical orientation to another. So a psychoanalytic or psychodynamic therapist might be a bit more interested in early life experiences and family interactional patterns. A cognitive behavioral therapist might be more interested in asking about how they learned various behaviors, what their self schemas are, so what kind of thoughts arise in you when you think about yourself and what you think of yourself. Um, an interpersonal therapist might be interested in how the person tends to react and interact with others. Uh, what do you expect from others? What do others seem to expect of you? How do you handle disagreements? How do you handle letdown? What are some of the major sources of support or conflict interpersonally in your life? Right, and those things will be filled in differently based on your own philosophy of care, as well as the setting that you work in, right? You'll have much different questions for um, an adolescent who you're assessing for potential learning disability or ADHD, than you will for an adult who's showing up for routine outpatient care uh, related to trauma or related to personality disorder problems. Okay, so you'll fill in those things in, in different ways. Um, but the list I was giving is, I think, a, a pretty solid way to think about, in general, what should I ask? Okay, so lastly, moving on to this last idea here of prediction. The intake assessment, in many ways, is geared toward your ability to predict things about this client. As I was just mentioning, you want to be able to predict safety. Right, so if they leave your office and you have reason to believe that they are not safe at home or they're not safe at their own hands because they might be seriously suicidal or they may have serious homicidal intentions, then you need to do something about it, right? We have an ethics code that guides us. Related to safety, you want to be able to predict what sort of treatment the patient or client needs. So how frequently should they be seeing you? Are they stable enough to be doing outpatient therapy or might it be more appropriate for this person to look at a partial hospitalization program or a fully inpatient program? You'll be helping them make some of those decisions. So you're predicting what they need. You're also predicting what sorts of treatment from you is going to be most beneficial, right? So what talking points, what activities, what challenges or homework assignments, if you will, what kinds of behavioral changes, what sorts of insights would offer them the most growth and change and healing. So you're trying to figure out what is it that I need to do as the therapist over the next few times that I get to see this person. So. It means several different things, but ultimately you are trying to predict the future uh, to an extent with this client. How safe are they? How stable are they? What sort of treatment do they need? And what should I bring to the table as the interviewer? Okay, so there is a lot more I could say about conducting an intake interview, but these are the basics, right? So no matter what you do, go into the room confidently, go into the room with an eagerness to get to know this person and to help them and to learn about them. And if you just sort of curiously, organically follow a drive to connect to them as another human, that'll fill in a lot of the gaps. 
but inevitably, especially for early clinicians, you'll probably get stuck at some point and you won't know what to do. So mentally revisit some of these ideas. Okay, what can I do from the biopsychosocial model that's the most helpful? What can I do to make sure that the data I'm collecting is useful? And what can I do to build rapport with them? Okay, so those are the key ideas. Have a great time getting started interviewing people. I wish you the best of luck. Have a great day.